Good morning. It's Teresa and we're in the garden very early this morning before it gets too hot here in Texas. Last week, we left off in John chapter 11 where everyone was wondering whether Jesus was gonna come to the Passover celebration. Well, he did. We start in chapter 12 and it says six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared for Jesus in his honor. It was at a man's house named Simon. Simon was a leper that uh, Jesus had healed and he was very grateful. And of course, Martha and Mary and Lazarus were all very grateful that Jesus had raised him from the dead. So they were giving him this meal in honor of everything he had done for them. A dinner was prepared and Martha served. We always see Martha serving, but this time she wasn't complaining like before when she went up to Jesus and said, why don't you tell her to get up and help me? I'm doing all the work and she's just sitting there at your feet. Well, usually when we see Mary, she is at Jesus' feet. She's listening to every word that he says because he is teaching her things that she is going to need to know just like Jesus is still teaching us things that we need to know. And we need to be at his feet listening to him by reading this word. That's what we're doing this morning. So Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate. Ironically, we are never told not one word that Lazarus ever says, but his life demonstrated his belief in Jesus to be Messiah and the miraculous act that Jesus performed. Well, it wasn't an act. It was a, a wonderful thing that Jesus did for Lazarus. But Jesus was also showing the people he was going to be resurrected. This was the last thing that Jesus did before he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He raised Jesus from the dead. It was the thing that was the straw that broke the camel's back and made the Pharisees and Sadducees go, we have to put him away. He's doing things that are getting the people's attention. The people are following him. And we are afraid that the Romans are gonna take everything away from us, all power, all wealth, all authority. Because if we can't show that we're in control of these people, the Romans will come in and take control. And if all these people are following Jesus and believing what Jesus says, they're not following us and believing what we say. So this raising of Lazarus from the dead was a very important miracle that Jesus did. And it prepared the way for him to come into Jerusalem. A lot of people were coming into Jerusalem because they knew Lazarus and they wanted to touch him and make sure he was really alive. They wanted to make sure the stories they heard were really true. Some people were wanting to come in to see Jesus and sit at his feet and learn from him. So it says a dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary got up and took a 12 ounce jar, it was an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. This nard perfume came from India and it was worth about $3,500. Some people believe that it was an inheritance that was handed down to Mary and perhaps she was going to use that for her dowry, but she brought it out because she had been listening to Jesus. She knew Jesus was going into Jerusalem for the very last time. She knew that he was going to be arrested. She knew he was going to be lifted up on a cross. And she knew the purpose that God had sent Jesus to die for the sins of the world so that everyone would have an opportunity to be with God the Father and Jesus for eternity. She believed this. She also knew it was custom in her culture to anoint someone who had died before you put them in the tomb. And the Holy Spirit must have given her a word that there wasn't going to be time to do that from the time Jesus was taken from the cross and laid in the tomb. <clears throat> she gave everything she had 
to help Jesus. We need to allow ourselves to get to that place where we will give everything we have to Jesus. It's only in that way that we can truly serve him. She was worshiping Jesus by anointing his head and his feet with oil. So Mary took a 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of spikenard and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. I've worn my hair down today on purpose. I don't normally wear it down, not because of the reason that she didn't wear it down. I don't wear my hair down because it's too hot in Texas to wear my hair down. But in her day, the only time a grown woman would let her hair down was in the private presence of her husband. And she did it to glorify her husband. Her, her hair was her husband's glory. That's what scripture says. And so she didn't let her hair down around everybody else because it was specially reserved for her husband. She was treating Jesus as a husband by letting her hair down and wiping this oil on his feet with her hair. I tell women whose husbands pass before them that now it is time for them to let Jesus show them how to husband her. Scripture says a husband should love his wife like Christ loved the church, even to the point of laying his life down for her so that she can be sanctified of all spots and blemishes and be presented back to him as a perfect bride. This means that Jesus laid his life down for the church and husbands are supposed to lay their life down for their wives. And Mary wasn't married, but she knew Jesus was going to lay his life down for her. And the Bible talks over and over again about how the church is Jesus' bride. So she was honoring him and respecting him with pouring this oil, giving everything she had in an honor and worship of him. Scripture says that wives should honor and respect their husbands. And so she was treating Jesus as a husband. And I honestly believe that women should learn to let Jesus husband them before they get married. Because if they do, when they get married, then they're looking to Jesus to help them understand how to be a wife to their husbands. Husbands are human, and they make errors. They are not perfect. But Jesus is that perfect husband. And so she is honoring him in a way nobody else has honored him. It goes on to say uh, that Judas, that the house was filled with the fragrance of this oil. Spikenard is a very beautiful fragrance. I just bought a bunch of gardenia trees to put in my garden. I love the smell of gardenias. And the whole garden will smell like gardenias when they're in bloom. And this room that they were having this meal in was filled not only with the fragrance of spikenard, it was also filled with the worship that Mary was demonstrating to Jesus. She was a worshiper. Her sister was a server, and she was doing what she did best. She was serving everyone without complaint. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth the year's wages, and it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But it wasn't because he cared about the poor. It was because he was a thief from the beginning. Jesus had chosen him as one of his disciples, knowing that he would be the one that betrayed him. Somebody had to do it, and it had to be someone that was close to him. So that when you get betrayed by someone that's close to you, you can turn to Jesus and he goes, I know what that feels like. Jesus also gave Judas the right to be in the treasury because Judas worshiped money more than he worshiped Jesus. And Jesus knew how Judas would take care of the money in the treasury, that he would dip into it, he would pilfer it, he would use it for his own benefits. 
So scripture said, not that he cared for the poor, but he was a thief. And since he was charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied to Judas, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. It's not that Jesus doesn't care about the poor. We know he cares about the poor, but he also was there for a short period of time. And he said, take care of me first. That's not selfish. That's take care of the ones that are with you when they are living. Send flowers to people that are living. Don't wait until they die to send flowers to you. They can't enjoy them. The ones that are left behind can enjoy them. But those flowers don't last very long usually. So, all the people heard of Jesus' arrival and they flocked to him. He was coming into Jerusalem and there were people from this meal that were following him. The people that wanted to see if Jesus really had raised Lazarus from the dead and the people that wanted to follow Jesus. And then the people in Jerusalem that heard Jesus was coming and they were coming into Jerusalem and both groups were meeting at the same time as Jesus entered Jerusalem. The leading priest had decided they had to kill Lazarus also. They had to destroy all proof that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember, there's two groups in the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in miracles. The Pharisees did, but the Pharisees were consumed with the law. The Sadducees were those that were priests in the leaders, and they were paid by the Romans to keep the peace. So these two groups didn't get along because the Sadducees didn't pay too much attention to the law and the Pharisees believed in resurrection and miracles. Only they weren't attributing the miracles that Jesus was doing as to him being Messiah. And neither group wanted Jesus to be called Messiah because both of them would lose something if he was. The Pharisees would lose the authority over the people because what they were teaching them was not correct. And the Sadducees would lose authority over the people because the Romans would come in and take over if the Sadducees could not control the people. The leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too because it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. We've studied this three times before in the three previous Gospels. This is the last time we will study Jesus' entry and his crucifixion and death in depth. It is most important to John that he bring the most important facts to us about Jesus being Messiah. Other Gospels give us details that John does not give, and John gives us details that the others do not give. So he doesn't give the story about Jesus telling his disciples to go get a donkey and a colt that would be tied up and tell the people that owned it, the master has need of it. John just tells that there's large groups of people waving palm branches, branches and this was a way to honor a king. They were also singing a praise song called the Hallel. This song was sang at the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a joyful, triumphant, victorious song that was sang. And these people believed that Jesus was finally going to come in and take authority over these horrid Romans that had them under their control, put them in their place, and restore rulership of the Jewish nation to Israel. And he will do that when he comes back the second time. And if they had read their scriptures carefully, they would have realized this. But they thought he was coming in to be a conquering king. But he came in as a prince of peace. If he had been a conquering king, he had been riding a horse like he's going to be riding when he comes that second time to deliver us once and for all from evil and death. But this time, he's coming to bring peace to us through making a way for us to get out from under 
the punishment and the condemnation of our sin. He's bringing us peace. So they're singing, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. And before he had told people not to call him king, but this time he was not telling them to stop. It says, Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy of, um, is it Zechariah or Isaiah, Zephaniah, that he would come in. Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand this at the time, that it was a fulfillment of prophecy. I'm trying to make sure that it's the Zephaniah one. Zephaniah 3, Zech Zephaniah 315. They wouldn't realize this until he had been crucified, that 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 had been written about him had been fulfilled when he rode that donkey in. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus, Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Remember, the prophets told of all kinds of signs that would herald the Messiah coming. But then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after them. <clears throat> what they were saying is there's nothing that we can do but kill him. So they're plotting to arrest and kill Jesus, and they also wanted to kill Lazarus. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip. All the disciples had both Greek and Hebrew names, and Philip was this man's Greek name. And so these Greeks, who were Gentiles, who came to be worshipers of the Lord, came to Philip. He also was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and that's a place that they knew well. So they said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. And Philip really wasn't sure what to do. So he took these Greeks to Andrew. Every time we hear about Andrew in the Bible, he's always taken somebody to Jesus. And when he took them to Jesus, Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. Jesus was talking about his crucifixion as being a time that he would enter into his glory. He was gonna be glorifying God when he, crucif when he was crucified on the cross because he was gonna be obeying God to the death. He was laying his life down for God's children. And he says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. Recently, I pulled up a small sprout of a pecan tree that was coming up in one of my flower beds. And when I pulled it up, it was attached to a seed. And that seed was cracked. And from that crack came the sprout of the new pecan tree. Now that pecan, I'm sure, had been buried by a squirrel in my garden. But when that nut was put in the ground, the wetness of the rain and water and the soil would make that nut crack, the outer shell. And that cracking has to happen in order for the meat of the seed inside to sprout up. And when that tree grows, it's gonna produce many pecans. If that squirrel had eaten that pecan right then, it would have only eaten one pecan. But if it had waited until that seed was put in the ground and dies to itself in order to produce a lot more, it would have had a lot more to eat. So I, I, I wish I had that pecan seedling here to show you today. So if you would just picture a pecan seed that was under the ground and cracked open and then a sprout came up from it to become someday a great pecan tree. But this one didn't. It went in my trash can because it was in the wrong place. But Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. It's just one. 
but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Jesus' death was going to make the way for many people to live for, for forever with God the Father. Caiaphas, remember last week, had actually prophesied about this when he didn't even realize what he was saying. Jesus goes on to say, those who love their life in this world will lose it. If Jesus had not died on the cross, he would not have accomplished what the Father sent him to do. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. So, does that mean you're not supposed to take care of yourself? No. But it means you're supposed to do what God the Father tells you to do. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me. That's the obedience. Because my servants must be where I am. Mary was always at the feet of Jesus. I try as much as possible to be listening to scripture or reading my Bible or doing something that has to do with feeding me the Word of God. I want to learn how God wants me to be. I want to take every thought captive so the Holy Spirit can guide my every word so that it helps people and helps myself. Jesus says, the Father will honor anyone who serves me but my soul is now deeply troubled john doesn't tell us about jesus in the garden of gethsemane praying sweating drops of blood saying father if this cup can be taken from me let it be taken from me but i want your will to be done but john says should i pray father save me from this hour but this is the very reason that i came father Bring glory to your name. And then a voice from heaven speaks and says, I've already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard this voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to Jesus. It was the voice of God. The voice of God was heard when John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. Moses heard the voice of God. There are a few times in the Bible that multitudes of people heard the voice of God. God tried to speak to all the people and the people said, No, we don't want to hear from you. It's too loud. It hurts our ears. You speak to Moses and Moses will speak to us. Moses was like a preview of coming attractions of Jesus. Jesus came to tell the people what God the Father had to say. But a lot of the people didn't listen to him because they didn't want to stop doing the things that they were doing. They didn't want to die to themselves. They didn't want that thing they were doing to die. They didn't want to put it in the ground and let Jesus crack them of their relationship to that habit so that a new spirit could grow from them that would produce much fruit. Then Jesus said, that voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. Now, that time is actually when he comes the second time, but he's saying the time for judging this world has come. He said, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. There were a lot of people that came to believe in Jesus as Messiah when they saw him crucified, buried in the earth, in the ground, and then he was resurrected, given new life. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. I'm going to read that again. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. So he's speaking in a present and future time, that dual prophecy here. Remember, we've talked about that before. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. And the crowd responded, We understood from Scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? This is what happens when we lean to our own understanding and do not let the Holy Spirit 
explain to us what is said in Scripture. They did not have the Holy Spirit inside of them yet because Jesus had not died and sent his Holy Spirit back to dwell inside of them. The Holy Spirit was supposed to be uh, with the priest and the leaders so that they could teach the children of Israel the truth, but he was not in them at all. Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little while longer. Walk in the light while you can, so that the darkness does not overtake you. Are you walking in the light of Jesus? Or are you walking in darkness? Darkness does not like the light. Usually when Jesus tells you to do something, it's something you don't want to do because you don't want to lay that down. You don't want to bury it in the ground. But it's the best thing to do. And he's encouraging them to listen to what he has to say right then. This is the last time he speaks to the people publicly. After this chapter 12, he will only be speaking to his disciples. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they're going. This is true. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. Who do you want to belong to? You want to belong to the light or to the darkness? Well, the light is God. And he sent that light to the world called Jesus. Ancient scripture says that the Messiah will come through the Jewish people to be a light to all the nations. Those Greeks that came to Philip, they were being drawn to the light. And Jesus came to tell everyone, it's both. Greeks and Gentiles that will be engrafted into the kingdom of God. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. He didn't speak to the crowds anymore. But despite all the miraculous signs that Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. And this is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe. And God knew the people couldn't believe. And so he told Isaiah they wouldn't believe. And he said, The Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and have them heal them. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people like that. They will not come to the light. They love the darkness more than they love the light. And God knew at the beginning of time who these people would be. But there are a lot of people in darkness that when you shine your light on them like Jesus shone his light on them, they believe. So don't be afraid to let your light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this. Ancient scripture, hundreds of years before. He saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue for believing in Jesus. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Remember, we are supposed to seek God's approval, not other people's approval, because other people are human and they have their own agendas going on. Jesus shouted for the last time to the crowds, If you trust me, you are not only trusting me, but also the God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me. He's talking about right then. For I have come to save the world and not judge it. He's talking about at that moment. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth that I have spoken. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands 
lead to eternal life. So I say, whatever the Father tells me to say. It's important that we only say what the Father tells us to say because then we know that we are speaking truth and it will lift others up and bring them to the Lord. I love you and next week, Jesus is going to have a Passover meal that we're going to talk about. Y'all have a great week and stay in the light.